Our friends at Perla are big proponents of simple, long-term investing, and now they're rewarding you for being a long-term investor too. Perla investors receive points every time they fund their account and invest. The more points you earn, the higher your chances to win one of their weekly prizes or the big prize at the end of the month. To get started, check out the competition terms and conditions and open your Perla account today using the links in your podcast player. This episode of the Australian Finance Podcast is proudly supported by GlobalX ETFs and the launch of the US100 ETF, better known as N100. N100 offers Australian investors exposure to 100 of the largest non-financial companies listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. N100 focuses on innovation-driven companies, providing a growth tilt to core portfolio holdings. You can learn more about N100, including reading the PDS and TMD by clicking the link in your podcast player or by simply heading to globalxetfs.com.au. Welcome to the Australian Finance Podcast. I'm Kate Campbell. And I'm Owen Rusk. And we're here to give you the tools and knowledge to invest both your time and money better. If you're new, feel free to jump in with our Starter Pack series that aired in early 2022 or our Shares or ETF mini series. We've got plenty to share with you in today's episode, but if you want to catch us on socials, head to Rusk Australia on Insta and Twitter. I'm also found at Kate Campbell AUS on Insta. And I'm Owen Rask AU on Insta. Just beware of the fake accounts. We'll never DM you about trading strategies or crypto. And if it sounds a bit weird, it's probably not us. And just one final heads up before we get into the show. This podcast contains general financial information only. Welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. I'm your host, Kate Campbell, and today I've got Owen Rask and Drew Meredith, financial advisor, with me to do an investing listener Q&A. So we're answering all of your questions that you've sent in during the month of August because we had investing month on the podcast. So lots of investing questions came our way. Yeah, we've got um, some really good questions today from all types of uh, investors, new and experienced, and Might I just say that was a great intro from you, Kate. Very well done. Trying to mix things up. Trying to mix things up. Um, So we're going to be talking about uh, investing. Chances are we're going to talk about some ETFs, some different types of things, shares, that type of stuff. Just be mindful to uh, read our financial services guide on our website and you can get in touch with the Waddle Partners team. If you're in any way interested in retirement or preparing for retirement, check out the link. It says uh, financial planning in the show notes. And the reason that I want you to bring that up as well is because you should seek the advice of a licensed and trusted professional before you act on any of the information. We say this every episode for good reason. It's because we get like a really short, often funny name sent through with a funny question that has some serious connotations. And we try to have a bit of fun with it But we don't know your full circumstances. So make sure you go and you speak to a licensed professional or just read the product disclosure statement of an ETF before you invest. Yep. And if you have questions for us, there is a link in your podcast player and in the show notes that you can send your questions our way for consideration for next month's Mm -hmm. Q&A episode, which will not just be investing focus, we'll answer anything and everything. So send it to us. But I guess to kick things off, Drew... What's something this month that you've spent money on that's boosted your happiness? A holiday. Oh. Where'd you go? Probably, uh, I was up in Noosa. I know you were joking <laughs> off air about <laughs> Noosa. the amount of travel, but uh, yeah, the family were up in Noosa uh, for five days last week. Took the kids? Um, took the kids, yes. <laughs> took oh. the kids, definitely. Theme parks? Uh, no, no theme. Noosa. I don't know. I haven't made a place. Um, um, uh, <laughs> is it Australian? Uh, is it Steve? Steve Owens, Australia Zoo. Yeah, yeah, that's not far. But uh, no, basically just enjoyed some sun after what's been a pretty long and dire Melbourne winter. <laughs> wow. 22 degrees every day. That's great. So you got a yeah. big happiness boost from spending money on a holiday. Yeah, what they say, fill up your empathy bucket when you're- uh, when you're on holidays, do things you enjoy, running in the running in the sun, running up to Hell's Gates. What does that mean? Fill up your empathy bucket. <laughs> so, <we're, laughs> uh, I, I mean, I'm curious. Em- empathy is when you have empathy for other people. So yeah. you you are in and in our we run multiple businesses. There's a lot of uh, people that we work with, and you're constantly dealing with people's emotions or people's growth or people's development yeah, yeah. Uh, and it can be yeah it can be emotionally tiring so that's what holidays are all about or finding hobbies that you enjoy or passionate about mm. Kate, similar to what you two do here 
That's yeah. why you feel so excited after a podcast or during. Oh, we feel so excited. Um, <laughs> Kate, what have you spent on this past month that's brought you happiness? I have been going to lots of different farmers markets. I think I've mentioned oh, this yeah, in the podcast this, yeah. before, but sometimes I've been saving money, but sometimes there's just really nice stuff to get at farmers markets, really good quality produce. So I've enjoyed spending money there and trying lots of different things. I made a really nice pearl couscous salad the other night. I'm pearl s- couscous. Yes. Do you use real pearls? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and that's how it works. That's how she spent her money. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. I, I ate pearls and my teeth survived. Uh, but I'm obsessed with Recipe Tin Eats. I've mentioned that website yeah, before, have. but they have some fantastic recipes there. Yeah. Cool. What well, about you? Did you buy another turkey or? Did not buy another turkey. Did you eat the turkey? No, but I did look up how to do that um, <laughs> just in case there was like a long winter. Um, but full disclosure, people not eating the turkeys. Okay. Just to be very clear. And I do get in the garden quite a bit, Kate. Just want to bring that one up for one YouTube commenter in particular. Um, What did I spend on this month? Well, actually, I was trying to just go back through my calendar because I missed that in the talking points today. But um, I did spend, and you were part of this, did spend on an absolutely delicious seafood platter. In Townsville. In Townsville. (laughs) Sea bar on the promenade there. Unreal. It, yeah, got a bit it was of, huge. It was huge. And it was 69, 70 bucks. I think it was something like that. Um, it was definitely meant for two people. But it was. It said <laughs> seafood platter for one, a yes. big slab of barramundi, a salad, some of the best squid I've ever had, 20 mussels, this oysters. Pre or post show. There was cal- prawns. Prawns. And then there was, oh, those prawns. This oh was pre show. Gosh. <laughs> And then there was um, something else in there. What was the other thing? Oh, the oysters kill Patrick. My gosh. Sweet potato chips. Oh, sweet potato chips. If you are in Townsville or you're passing through, go to Sea Bar. Do yourself a favour. Unbelievable. Seriously. I don't think you could move oh. afterwards. <laughs> Although we did try those scooters we for did the first on the, time. We got on the so scooters. Yeah, and that was a bit of a waste of money because there was four of us with Renato from Model Partners and we were scooting around Townsville. And it was probably a good 25 bucks to go about <laughs> two kilometres, but we had heaps of fun. Yeah. So there's yeah. some things. You know, that was good. Actually, It was a lot of fun, though. And I do like to, um, you know, get a few things into the old mouth every now and again and enjoy the tastes and wonders of the world. What's See, that got on to do the with scooter or eating? Oh, that too. With the bugs. No, but like, I, what I mean is, like, I really value eating out. Um, and I know, like, Mr. Money Mustache would be like, he would, he would not approve. But I see it as an experience. And I really enjoy it. Enjoy it. Things that I wouldn't eat myself or cook myself at home. So, Perfect. Yeah. yeah, cool. Good one. All right. So we're, our very first question is from Drowning Lifeguard. The best way or time to invest. So listen to our Investing Month podcast. They're very new to investing and they've now got some understanding and confidence about why investing is so important. They're slowly getting their feet wet and trying not to drown at the same time. The question is, what's the best way or time to invest? And we had a very uh, similar question about what's the best time of day to purchase shares from another listener. So we've got two great questions here from Sherry and Drowning Lifeguard. Very similar. Time of day or when to invest, timing the market. Um, maybe you go- I just start incredibly high level with okay, this, which is, sure. and you talk about all the time, which is that, and is it paralysis or analysis paralysis? Yes. To the, yeah, yeah. To, the, to the point that- <laughs> We make so many different reasons and makes and and I mean I can talk about my wardrobe as a similar <laughs> similar way to do this, but there's so many decisions you can create or or barriers you can create to just investing, and and the the answer the big answer here is that it's really what happens over the long term that matters, not what time of day you're mm. trading. There is I mean I can provide a more straightforward answer, which is generally you don't want to trade first thing in the morning or last thing at the end of the day. And that's basically, I think, the only rule. But the but the you're talking about one day versus another, and it's and it's how you invest over long term, how regularly invest, how long you stay exposed to the market. That's going to be more important to your returns than buying at two p.m. versus ten a.m. Mm. on any given day. Mm. Mm. I think like if most people think about their goals for investing, nine out of ten people in the RAS community invest for a, one of three things: it is early retirement, normal retirement, or uh, passive income. Those yeah. are the three things that our community invests for. And if you think about all of those things, cast your mind forward to when you've achieved those goals. Will you look back and think, wow, I'm gr- so grateful that I traded at 11.56 rather than 10 a.m. Or yeah. I paid 
seven dollars instead of six instead of seven dollars fifteen cents. I think a lot of people. This is not one thing that should be on your your barriers to entry. To Drew's point, I think Kate, um, this is something that everyone should just be mindful of. That to measure your returns in years, not months, days, weeks, or even hours, and just get on with the business of investing. And I know it's easy for us to say, and we know that there are so many barriers, but this doesn't have to be one because it doesn't really matter. Um, at the end of the day, you don't have to worry about all that sort of stuff. Just focus on your long-term goal and f- imagine yourself in 20 or 30 years looking back at your decision now, what would that person say to you? And they would say, invest. They wouldn't tell you when, they'd just say invest. That would be my advice. Yeah, and if it's much easier to, you know, if you've got a busy day or you, you know, you work working between ten and four, there's no problem with putting an order on before mm. you go to market. Or oh, that's why automation and and a lot of the platforms make it so easy to automatically invest. And it doesn't matter whether it's in the morning or at night; it's just done. Yeah, and um, same with um, like I know some people do and don't like dollar, uh, dividend reinvestment plans, but if you select your dividend reinvestment plan, it's just a simple way to take one decision off your plate. Your dividends are automatically reinvested. Um, in the beginning, that's what I would focus on. As you get your portfolio gets bigger, maybe you can become a bit more sophisticated. And that reference to my wardrobe was about. You want to come to that? Here we you go. You can't say that and not follow it up. Yeah. But it's, how do you get rid of as many decisions as possible in oh. the morning? Like, uh, if you watch, I get stuck on Instagram like everyone else, and all these reels come up. But if you've got blue and white shirts, you've only got one choice: it's blue or white. And if you've got white and black t-shirts. It's another choice. Yeah, yeah, I like you're it. basically just reducing the amount of decisions you have to make and the, the reasons that would stop you from doing something. Mm. So is the, I don't the summary of that, that is that you wear the same outfit every day. <laughs> yeah, you reduce the amount of decisions. No, you don't have to wear the same outfit, not Steve Jobs. No, or you've the got the five variations <laughs> of the same. Yeah, and blue and white shirts go with everything. So it's kind of you can, oh, most things, but you, you can't get too much wrong and you're narrowing the, the, the friction Every morning. Yeah. You're making it easier for yourself. Yeah. And the same thing goes for investing. Get, yeah. Remove as many of those hurdles as possible and just let it happen. Yeah. This is not one of those ones that you should spend any time thinking about beyond getting the answer to this in this podcast is just invest. Yeah. Um, it's more important what you're investing in, how long you're investing in it for, and how often you're investing. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Next question is from Drop Bear Market. With a lot of growth mm. happening in startups or young companies, is there a central repository of IPO offerings for Australia and the US? So before we jump into that, we should just explain what an IPO is. Owen? Oh, sure. Yeah. An IPO is an initial public offering. Um, as Jordan Belfort or uh, Leonardo DiCaprio says in um, The Wolf of Wall Street, he starts explaining how they're going to do an IPO of a company. They said, don't worry, you don't need to worry about it. Just there's lots of money happening. But basically what happens in an IPO is this is the first time that a company's shares are put on the stock market. Um, and so typically what we find is that when the stock market is doing very well is when we see most of these IPOs, initial public offering, meaning that the company is going to become a public company on the stock market. Um, and what happens is you can buy shares pre-IPO, and that's what Drew will talk to in a minute. Pre-IPO means that you are buying the shares through a deal that's done not through your brokerage account, it's done through a broker or directly with the company. You buy shares, they add your name into the ASIC register, and then when the shares go on the stock market, all of a sudden they appear in your bank account or in your brokerage account, and then you can trade them like anyone else. And that's the that's the process of an IPO. Now, why just quickly, why does a company do it? Because a company can do it and they can sell additional shares when they do this. So they can sell shares to these new investors which then means that they get money in the bank or their existing shareholders can sell. So the capital or the money flows to the company's bank account or to the existing investors who previously owned it. It's a very common method for founders to get out of companies, for example. And the whole purpose of the share market is to give companies access to additional capital they couldn't mm-hmm. raise. You know, if it's a if it's a business that's privately owned and only three shareholders, it's hard to ask those people for more money or introduce new shareholders. Yep. Uh, the ASX has massive, you know, reporting requirements. So uh, it opens the ability for them to raise capital mm-hmm. um, and allow them to grow or yeah. So the big one businesses. at the moment is probably like ARM. People who watch the US news have probably seen ARM holdings is coming to the market is doing an IPO. In recent years, some of the more popular ones were like Snowflake in the United States. Isn't that Beyond Meat? Beyond Meat was another one. Yeah. So a lot of these companies were big private companies that went onto the stock exchange. Um, and those companies that are the big ones that do it, they call them unicorns. 
Yeah. Um, but they're becoming more common, those big ones that then are even bigger on the stock market. But Drew, how do you keep up to date with this sort of stuff? What do you think? How do you think about this high, like big picture? Zoom it's, in. How do you think about it? I think it's a highly corporate or professional process, as you, you know, I mean, you worked um, in in anal- analytical world before. Yep. And a lot of the IPOs or all the IPOs are controlled by broking, and they're also so most of these companies are being covered in the uh, while they're private, and then they're helping them raise money at some point in the future. So a lot of getting access to IPOs, you have to be have relationships with brokers generally. It's very difficult otherwise, or have a relationship with the company, which I'm sure you've done as as a private company. Mm. Uh, in that way, it's those brokers and research providers generally have the knowledge of what's upcoming. But there are, I think, I found IPO Watch and mm-hmm. and I think the ASX also the has ASX a listing. Has a list. Yeah, but that's only IPOs which have been lodged uh, with ASIC or, or ASX uh, as to their intention to list on the market. So there could be there'd be a thousand companies that are considering it at some point, but this is only the ones that are going through that legal process of doing it. Mm. And there's lots of tiny companies that list on the ASX. Well, every year, they're just not always the most investable for you and I. Yeah, that's right, Kate. So, um, a lot of small companies, a lot of people think that Australian share market equals ASX. It's not true. There are multiple share markets in Australia. It's just the most popular one is the ASX. Um, and that's where most of us do our investing. If you have a brokerage account, there's a chance that your brokerage account is not just trading ASX shares. It's also trading shares on the CBO exchange, which is the other one, CBOE. But there's another one called the National Stock Exchange, which is for very small companies. And then you can have those other types of platforms, which are not really stock exchanges, but just help you buy and sell. And so these are very common, uh, much more common than you think. And to the, the point with this question at the top was, quote, with a lot of growth happening in startups or young companies, end quote, um, a lot of the startups and young companies will not be IPO companies. They will be before the ASX, maybe a few years before the ASX. What you typically find coming to the ASX are, are slightly larger companies. Um, and those companies have bit got profits and they've been manicured to look good for the stock exchange. Um, the small, small companies that you might be thinking of, a lot of them can be found on platforms like Virtual, which we've spoken to. Uh, Equitize. Equitize. Some of those platforms that we've spoken to on the show before. Um, primary markets. Primary so, markets. Yeah. Yep. Those. And Booktopia would be an example. Yeah, Booktopia. So what Booktopia did, Kate's book's available on Booktopia, <laughs> Speak of the Devil. It's already out. Yeah, yeah. So Booktopia. Uh, Booktopia is an Australian company and it did a sale of shares and people could invest in it before it was on the ASX, it was traded on one of those platforms. Then they got that money, invested, grew, and then they put it on the ASX where people could buy and sell. Another example that people might be able to relate to here is a company that I've been speaking to recently called Cobram Estates. Cobram Estates makes Red Island olive oil. Uh, They make the Cobram Estates really good olive oil. Very good on a... uh, (laughs) Roast lamb. Mm-mm. It's rosemary send you a free bottle. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Um, that's not why I'm saying this, of course. Full disclosure. Um, but they did something really interesting. Is they when they this is Australia's biggest olive oil producer. When they were thinking of an IPO, I was saying to them, "Why are you doing this?" Because they were trying to go through this broker network, and that broke down. They they refused to work with the brokers in the end because yeah. the brokers were demanding lower prices and more of the share yeah. because they get paid handsomely. Um, and so what they did is they said, well, bugger it. We're not going to sell any additional shares, basically. We're just going to list and give people the opportunity to sell their shares. And who were the people that were selling the shares? All of their employees who had got the shares over many years working for the company. And they just thought, well, the stock market's an easy way for them to sell. Yeah. And so we see that happen a lot. And that's a huge company, hundreds of millions of dollars. So that gives you more of an example of the size of these companies. Um, But do you invest in them? I think there's a famous kind of few paragraphs from Benjamin Graham in the Intelligent Investor book where he says, um, was Intelligent Investor that he was quoted in? Yes, I think it was. Um, This is where it's coming from, I think. He basically says that when you look at IPOs and the number of them that are happening, it's actually really indicative of the market cycle. Yeah. So if you see more IPOs happening, it means the stock market, people recognize that it's very frothy perhaps. And so you have to be very careful. And all I'd say in summary to anyone that's thinking about this, be very careful. I don't invest in IPOs. We've found more success investing in pre-IPO. Mm-hmm. Uh, not that we do it much anymore. 
uh, and the IPO process is so kind of orchestrated that yep. it, uh, you, a lot of the time you're better off waiting and seeing how it trades afterwards. Yeah, yeah just wait for it to be trading. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Hold music. You want to avoid it, and so do your customers. So say goodbye to hold music and hello to faster, smarter support with Salesforce. Make service more personal and agents more productive using built-in trusted AI. Then watch costs and wait times drop and satisfaction soar. Support customers in a whole new way with Service GPT. Learn how at salesforce.com slash service GPT. The next question from Clover Rover that I uh, labeled <clears throat> taking off the training wheels. Yep. Uh, essentially, in 2018, they were using a robo-advising platform mm-hmm. that held their investments in their own name, so they had their own holder identification number. The platform closed down, and then they had to transfer their holdings to a broker. So, for example, Comsec or Perler or Selfwealth or something like that. Mm-hmm. And now they're finding it a little bit more complicated because they're having to manage it themselves. So the question is, is it worth selling everything and just purchasing a really simple ETF for simplification? Because now they have to worry about things like rebalancing, which were previously done for them. Um, And they've heard other people who wanted to start over and didn't sell their existing holdings and instead moved towards dollar cost averaging in the new holdings. Okay, so this is a really good question because it focuses on someone who basically is a forced learner of investing. They were using something that did it for them versus now they're having to do it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of automation that can happen uh, even if you do do it yourself yeah. nowadays. Um, it could be someone else listening might have been on a micro investing app like Raise and now and, is on doing yeah. it themselves with a, a broker. And so there's a big learning Taken curve off the there. training wheels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like it, Kate. Well, we've talked about it like graduating. Yeah. Graduating. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what can you think about, basically? Um, it well, depends. It depends, is true. <laughs> I think that in this instance, it's pretty scary to go from um, someone doing it completely for me to me doing it myself. Thanks to ETFs, it does make things very simple. You can just set up like a BPay into your brokerage account or you can do the automated um, investing with some of the platforms now. Uh, you can also seek out in this instance, they're looking for one ETF that does it, but you can also seek out fund managers that do it, financial advisors that do it for you. There are so many different options here. Um, And it really comes down to what do you want to get out of your investing over the next 10 years, I think. Because what I would say to someone in this situation is, do you want to learn about investing? Because that is the number one thing. If you do, then go ahead, think about ETFs and building that portfolio. It's really not that bad once you listen to, say, the podcast for a few months and you get a handle on it. Um, And it could save you, you know, a bit of money. Mm. But if you want to pay extra for someone to do it for you, or in this instance, they mentioned something like Clover that they previously used, then you pay a bit extra. And I think that's what we're coming to now is a lot of our community, when we did a survey, just one final thing, did a survey of our members recently and only 40% of our audience said they want to do it themselves. And this is in our membership community where they I get they're paying to see research. So think about that for a moment. They're paying to see research, but only, I think it ended up being 38% of them wanted to do it themselves. And if you think about that, what they're basically saying is I'm paying for some research, but I don't really want to do it myself. I want someone else to do a lot of this. And if you do go down that path, pay a bit more. That's you will pay more, and that's fine. You're paying for professional help. That's fine. That's what I'd say. True. I mean, so many of these are. It depends, and it's, it's the worst answer. <laughs> I know Kate tagged me on LinkedIn a few weeks ago with <laughs> lawyers and accountants, and I'm neither. So somehow, financial <laughs> advisor in there as well. Uh, but it is what's like. What's your objective? What's the time frame? And one for this one is if you're having to rebalance yourself, how much time do you want to commit to it? Um, if you've got a framework, great. If you can automate most of it. Uh, but if it's if it's feeling like it's too much and you don't want to engage, or you don't want to engage at the moment, then potentially having a knowing that you know you're getting the average return for a fairly growth oriented portfolio might be enough but if you are more interested and you want to keep learning you want to keep researching uh, then it's just putting a framework around it as you've said and mm. automating as much of it as possible uh, so you're not investing a massive amount of time mm. and it's perfectly okay to not want 
to be an investor and just to have someone manage it for you yeah. on your behalf. Like That is completely acceptable. I'd say most Australians don't want to actually manage their investments themselves. They just want to know that they'll be able to reach their financial goals and that their family's future is taken care of. And I know our audience are kind of outliers in the fact that they, many of them do want to learn about all of this and put things into place. But you don't have to. That's why great financial advisors exist and great investment platforms exist. So you're, after you do all your learning, you might realize, okay, I understand enough to ask the important questions and to make sure I choose a good person or company to invest with. But mm. that, that's as far as I want to go on my own investing journey. Yeah. And a lot of people, so we've recognized this, Not I gave you the community data before. For every one person that listens to this, there's probably 99 others that can't be bothered listening to the Australian Finance Podcast and they'd rather be sewing or going to the beach with friends, picking up their potting mix from Bunnings, doing whatever they want to probably do. So the Australian Investors Podcast, not the Finance Podcast. Um, they don't want to listen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't want to listen to Drew and I over on the Investors Podcast. But my point is that everyone that listens to this, we are the anomaly, right? We're not the, if you take a sample of 50 people, a lot of those will use a financial advisor or just rely on super or just rely on property. Um, now, we think that there's more to life than that, the financial side of life. Um, I can't say too much, but basically what we're working on at RASC is something to solve that problem. So working on something where we, where you don't have to do it yourself, I'll say that. Um, I can't say much more, but I just, I think that there is a lot of, but to be said, to just having, just putting down, if it's for typically for blokes, it's typically just putting aside a bit of that kind of ego, having a little bit more humility and being like, it's okay if I pay someone a little bit of money to manage this really important thing for me. Um, and if you're a, a young woman or anyone really, and you think I want professional help with this, just be prepared to pay for it. I think we're at a point now in our industry, and we saw a study on this yesterday actually, where fees are no longer the only consideration. And I think that's really important. I'd say like we meet a lot of people that want some level of advice and nine out of 10 people just, they want to know what's happening and have a detailed understanding, but they don't want to have to worry about, you know, what one stock's doing or what's the next yeah. hot thing. They're, so many people just want to forget about it and there is a niche that just wants to know everything, pick the stocks, look at look at mining companies, look at this, look at that. But the, the vast majority just want to know their money is being taken care of in one way or another, whether it's Vanguard or whether it's a financial advisor. Yeah, and the Sleep ETFs, at night. To, to be more direct with this question, I 100% agree, Drew. Some of the um, ETFs, there's v various options available. So someone could have someone that does it for me, like a financial advisor, takes into account my whole picture. You could go to a platform which automates it all for you, like they pick the investments. You could use a broker which just does one ETF. So say like you could just open a, an account and just invest in VDHG, or you could invest in five ETFs that you mix yourself, or you could add some shares on and do that. So there's so many different options and it just depends on your, I think this is the thing, it depends on your time that you have available, your inclination, so your curiosity, um, and basically like your portfolio balance. Those are the things that you would take into account. Great question though, because a lot of people are in our community have bigger balances and they do need help. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. The next question is from the independent brokey. I want to buy NASDAQ shares with my Comsec International Shares account. I'm just coming back from a trip in the US where I've discovered a wonderful business that's listed on the NASDAQ stock market. Do I need a W8 Ben form to do so? Any other documents I need to think about? Love what you guys do, by the way. I've got a Comsec International Shares account and usually you would complete that form bef as you open the account, but it does need to be updated. So, but for, you have to probably step back and for context, what a W8 Ben form is. Yep. <laughs> Do it, Drew. Basically, there's, uh, the, the issue you have when you're investing in shares that are overseas outside Australia is they'll be taxed, the income will be taxed or generally taxed in that country uh, or withholding tax and then be included in your personal tax return when it comes here. So, Australia has taxation treaties that reverse most of that double taxation with most countries. The US is one of them. And this form basically identifies you as an Australian to the US share market and helps reverse that the potential for double withholding tax. Mm. Um, complicated form. We've completed many for our clients. Yeah. The W8 Ben E form relates to super funds, family trusts, SMSFs. 
that's probably the most difficult form I've seen in the, in the world. <laughs> but a lot of so, brokers are helping automate this process. So then, yeah, yeah. one of the for platforms as much I, as they can, yeah. I used it, filled yeah. it all in for you. You just have to review the details and press it. In a personal account. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah, for yeah, the yeah. W8, yeah. W8 Ben standard. If you go yeah. to the W8 Ben E, e it's, yeah. oh my lord. <laughs> so um, if you're doing well, this, let's just do it in your, generally doing your personal, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, it's just like doing, when you start a new job and you're doing a tax file number uh, declaration form. At, at the job, it's basically the same thing. Yep. You're providing your your ID, your address, all those sort of things, and you do need it. Otherwise, you'll have withholding tax deducted in the US that you won't be able to claim back in Australia. So, what might happen if you have US shares, for example, is you might be in your account and you might say, let's say, for example, you've sold your um, Apple shares for a five thousand dollar profit. They may automatically deduct thirty percent of that yep. and keep that. Now, if you fill out the W eight Ben form, what will happen is they'll only take fifteen percent. So that's that reverse, um, I guess, tax treaty that you were talking about. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Double tax treaty. Double tax yeah. treaty, yeah. Um, so you fill out the form, I think it's every three years. Yeah, so on Coms- opening and then every three years. Yeah, Comsec and all those will, will remind you. And as you said, Kate, a lot of them now do it in a digital way. Uh, and they, if they don't do it digital, all of them, all of the brokers that I've ever come across have instructions on how to fill it out. Now, they obviously can't tell you exactly what's what because you might not be the tax resident you think you are, but- it's pretty straightforward for most people. And it's the only extra layer of complexity with international investing that everyone should be aware of. Yeah. Good one. Anything else we need to consider when investing internationally? Currency. You, currency, obviously, yeah. Um, the spread that you pay on. There's a, There are quite a few things, but from a tax perspective, I think that's the n- number the one. Name. No yeah. other yeah. forms or anything. No, that'd be it. Okay, yeah. Cool. Yeah, 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 I mean, I, if you go to different countries, that's the other issue where you start to go to Europe, yeah. you know, the UK... Hong Kong, then you're going to have similar forms or lodgement requirements. They're not as common though, so you probably want to get expert tax advice on those. We do have a lot of people that are from, say, like the UK or Europe moving to Australia and um, get proper advice sometimes from both sides of the fence um, because it's not as straightforward as the US. Like a lot of Aussies, when they say they're investing internationally, what they mean is they're just investing in US shares, um, which is where most companies are accessible from anyway. So good question. All right. Next question from Queen Goose. Yes. Thank you both for such an insightful podcast and breaking down investing into layman's terms. I would be holidaying with my hard-earned money right now had I discovered your podcast before I started my investing journey. (laughs) Unfortunately, I took the advice of my then partner to invest my savings into individual shares. All my savings went in and so far I've lost 40%. What happens when a company is no longer listed on the ASX? A lot of the shares I own are down 90% and some are no longer listed. Do you need to declare this on your tax return? I've been feeling really silly and I've avoided my portfolio for the past year, but your podcast is slowly giving me the courage to face this mess. Cool. Um, This is hard because someone's lost a lot of money. Um, We all get it wrong. Like it's, you know, we've talked about it on the other podcast quite regularly and the companies are still listed and they're down 90%. So, I mean, this is part of investing and the most important thing is that you're learning lessons from from investing. But then the system, you've talked about headlines before, mm. particularly during the pandemic, wasn't particularly well set up for new investors. It was very hype driven and, you know, things like Robinhood that made incredibly, you know, gamified investing, which made it difficult to to assess companies properly. And yeah. I imagine there's a lot of other people listening that are in a similar boat. They started investing during maybe the pandemic or before and they invested in individual companies. Yeah. And maybe now they're realizing that wasn't the best decision for them at the time or maybe they needed to do some more research or they just took a tip from a friend. I'll tell you what, can I tell you what I think is the most concerning about this one right here, about this question, is the then partner comment. So, a lot of people are influenced by the primary person in their life about how to invest. So, in my life, there was a time when some people might remember when cryptocurrencies were cool. (laughs) Not so much anymore. And uh, my significant other and I had our only and very big argument about money because we'd just been at a family barbecue and someone had told her to invest in ripple cryptocurrency and i said we're not doing it there is no way on earth we are putting our money in something like that that did not go down well and i said okay take a few thousand dollars and do it 
if that's what you really want to do, do it. And the family member who was convincing her to do it, I said, take your money out now and put it in an index fund for your kids. And because I had tens of thousands of dollars made on this supposed currency. And what the lesson was here was that no matter my influence, no matter what I could say, there was no reasoning. And this, the concerning thing is that these types of things are happening every day and it's very hard to deal with on a general podcast like this yep. because it comes down to talking openly with your partner about money and how you allocate money as a couple. And these things can really put a rift between people, but it's really important that you have the dialogue and you hear them out. That said, once you get to this point where you've already lost the money, uh, how do you clean it up? Well, the, the really simple thing is to assess your losses. So open the account, have a look at what you're, you've lost. Even if you've lost, so some companies have failed, that's a 100% loss on your tax return. Um, so that's whatever the investment was, that is gone. So that is a capital loss. And you can... Drew can tell us he's a tax financial advisor. You can potentially use that to offset other things. Yeah, I mean, capital losses generally uh, have to be realized to claim them, but there are different ways to, to so realize, meaning you have to sell them. And a lot of the times if a company goes uh, shuts down or goes into bankruptcy or administration, it can take multiple financial years to actually get that capital loss. And the process has to finish up before you can before you officially can claim, claim the loss. has to be yeah, realized. exactly. But there are some options, like, like anyone we've been involved in, or exposed to some from from uh, now and then. There's a group, there's a website called delisted.com.au that you've probably seen, and that's a list of both listed and unlisted companies. You know, a stock like Brashes that became something you can actually find a lot of interesting data. You know, there's probably wrong a cohort it's also for Brashes. Very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Brashes. Remember those guys in the 1990s? I used to sell CDs before JB Hi-Fi, but I'm you know, pretty old. <laughs> <laughs> Is it like I sanity? I what you're talking about, Drew. <laughs> yeah, it was pre-sanity. <laughs> oh, my lord. Yeah, sorry. I'm Kate's quite got old. no idea. Um, but they, there's actually an option there age. where there are groups which I'm not advise, you know, advising or, or not advising either way, but they will buy shares in unlisted companies from you so you can actually realize that capital loss. You have to pay them to do it. Uh, and I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure where it goes, but it does give people that option for a company that's in administration. They might be buying the shares in it for one reason or another. Yep. Um, and so that's hard. Otherwise, when you've got your shares that are already on the stock, they're still on the stock exchange. Um, normally, what I would say in this instance, if someone wrote in and said this, I'd say, well, what was the reason that you bought it in the first place? That's what we call a thesis, and is it still alive? Um, but a lot of the times with some of these more speculative companies, like these companies that fall 90%, um, a lot of people that end up in these things don't know exactly why they ended up there. So what I would say is if you're prepared to cut your losses and move on, which is probably what I would do if I was in a situation like this, I can't tell anyone what to do. But if you're prepared to do that, just be prepared that you might cut your losses at a time when they then come back up for some random reason. And so just live with that regret and be prepared that that could be a regret that you have. But then from this moment on, you're in control of your own money. Even if you meet a new partner, you're in control of your own money. Um, and it would take a lot of convincing for you to not be in control of your money. And it may take years, even if that does cause some tension in the partnership early on. You're in control. Don't let this happen to you again, is what I would say. And the easiest thing to do from here is to be diversified. Yeah. And think about the opportunity you've got in front of you now and all the good stuff we've said throughout investing month of having a plan, writing down what you're investing in, where you're investing it, how often you're investing it, what would make you change your investment plan, like starting to do all of those things and just think I'm starting from scratch. Maybe mm. there's a little bit of money left over to kickstart that portfolio, but just sort of go back to the building blocks and relearn everything, build your portfolio up from scratch, and maybe even just sort of think of yourself as a brand new investor yeah. if you want to start, start Yeah, over. absolutely. And credit to you, Kate, because you orchestrated Investing Month, and a lot of people in here have loved it. And there was one here, she, she or he says at the end, uh, I'm going to binge on the Australian finance podcast and make my money grow, exclamation mark. <laughs> and that is awesome. So, um, maybe you don't have to make this decision right now and you can take a few months just to breathe a bit. Um, 
Yeah. And then reassess. And write down your plan. There's going to be a lot of there. emotions involved. And yeah. so coming to terms with all of that, this might be a really great opportunity to speak to someone mm. and just sort of work through all of this because, as we know, we don't make our financial decisions in a vacuum. All of our life sort of muddles in the middle there, our emotions, our decisions. So working through it so you can sort of move past that and have a really positive financial future. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. We've got one more to go and it's a really interesting not question question. Yes. So this was a great comment from one of our listeners. So this isn't a question and more so just a reminder about the importance of security when it comes to anything to do with your finances. Mm -hmm. Think banks, super, brokers, my gov. I unfortunately know somebody whose bank account got hacked because they reused the same password for multiple services. They listed a whole heap at CBA, Netflix, Facebook, Boopa, Twitter, among others. Their password became compromised in a data breach and the hackers were able to try that username and password combination for other common services until eventually they were able to log into a bank account and drain it. They didn't have two-factor authentication enabled, which is where a code sent to your phone and doubling the security. Thankfully, the small amount of money was recovered. However, there are a few free password managers which generate and store passwords, so there's really no excuse to be reusing the same passwords across multiple services. Some are even integrated with your devices, i.e. the iCloud keychain. Having different passwords for every account reduces your risk of having other accounts compromised. If one gets compromised, they won't be able to get into the others. Stay safe and be on the lookout for scams, and if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Yeah. This is a fantastic reminder for all of us. Yeah, there are two different... I would say there are two different types of kind of scams. There's like a scam and then there's a fraud or like a deliberate attempt to at theft. Scams are those things where they send you the links or the text messages and you click on the link and it looks like cost you but it's not kind of thing. Um, And then the other ones are like where they just take money. Flat out fraud. They just steal um, or they promise things. Which we talked about earlier this year. Yeah. Um, and like, you just need to be safe. Like, privacy is an illusion in our world. If you think you've got privacy online, or even just in the world that we live in, uh, welcome to twenty twenty three. But a lot of um, even the banks and the brokers are giving you options to have a rolling code on an authenticator app, uh, or mm. have two factor authentication with a one time password to your phone, or a backup code, or something like that, just to give a second layer of security. Two FA, yeah, Espe- that can be breached. I mean, that's how my friend. Remember in, uh, yeah, yeah. in Tell us March, the story. April this year was was breached. They uh, so the one lesson from it was the bank will never call you and ask you for codes is basically the 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 main part. But by the essentially they were able to get the login details and be logged into the bank account and then stay on the phone long enough uh, and and called multiple times, stay on the phone long enough and convinced the person that they were the security team at the bank and convinced them to hand over not one but multiple codes. The first code got into the account and the several codes that came, oh, that one's expired, like this telling this story all the way along for like 45 minutes. And then by the third code, it's like $75,000 being transferred out of a bank account, um, which I think two thirds was recovered somehow. But they're even multi-factor, it's more almost never, so never expect a bank to call you and ask you for information. Yeah, and I know that was happening earlier this year with people getting the the mum scam texts of saying the daughter saying I need a thousand dollars and the parents were like automatically transferring that money. Yeah. Huh. Well, yeah, um, yeah, the emails, the text messages, it's just never ending. Um, never click a link. Obviously, always look for the padlock in the browser bar before you put any information in. Yeah, my gov just go straight to the link, or <laughs> yeah, even yeah. just type in the link. No one sends you those. Like if you, when you see them, you can usually tell. But they are getting more and more um, sophisticated. Yeah, because yeah. it can look like the text came from the bank. It can look yeah. like the email came from an authentic Commonwealth Bank email address. Just one letter different somewhere. Yeah. yeah. There's an Owen Rosk getting around on Twitter as well <laughs> with crypto. It looks like Owen yeah. Rask, but it's an Owen Rosk. You just keep have an to eye be, out for him. Right. Yeah. So we use LastPass, which is similar to iCloud keychain yep. across our businesses, encrypted paid subscription um, that that will hold and change passwords for multiple groups. As you can imagine, we'd have three, 400 passwords that we have to deal with every day. So that extra mm. level of encryption and cybersecurity. So great reminder to use two-factor authentication. Be careful if anyone calls you from your providers and don't click on links, go straight to the source. 
Yep. And, and have different passwords. Don't have the same password for every website. We use yeah. Google Authenticator. Um, but I will say one final thing. If anyone promises you more than 10% returns or leads with that in any type of investment advertising, be very, very careful. I can explain why in another podcast or we can come back and explain that. But um, it's very much a scam. If it's promising you more than 10% returns or it's in- indicating that you will achieve that, it is very much a scam. Um, keep that in mind. If you're ever thinking, is this too good to be true? Probably is. All right. Okay, let's well, wrap this up, Kate. Thank you, everyone, for sending questions in for today's Q&A. Send more, please. Yes, if you have questions, we have a link in the show notes. Drew, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, there is also a link in the show notes. To- yeah, of course, uh, go on LinkedIn. Everyone's on LinkedIn these days and or waddlepartners.com.au. Mm-hmm. Um, Great. You've got a whole growing team. Yeah, there's a link in the show notes. You've probably heard Fatuma or Renato if you came to an event. Uh, Jamie, if you're on the Investors Podcast, check them out. What are partners? Send us your questions. We've got heaps of resources in the show notes. Don't forget Investing Month and Kate's new book, Buying Happiness. Get it. Booktopia, Amazon. Love it. Well done. Thanks, guys. Wonderful. Thanks for listening, everyone. Good to see you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. We hope you learned something new and were able to take one thing away from this episode. If you're keen to learn more, head on over to Rask Education and take one of our free money and investing courses. You could even become a Rask Core member for less than your Netflix subscription each month. And don't forget to subscribe for new episodes in your inbox every week. Plus, if you enjoyed the show, we'd love you to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and send any questions our way via the link in the description. And before we go on, did this podcast contain personal financial advice just for me? Absolutely not, Kate. Our podcast actually contains general financial information only. What that means is the information does not take into account your financial needs, goals, objectives, or even your situation. So because of that, it's important that you consider if the information is appropriate to you and your needs before acting on it. If that all sounds a bit confusing or you're still working out what your needs are, it's a great idea to consult a licensed and trusted financial planner. And don't forget to do your own research. This podcast was proudly sponsored by InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginner Investors. Build your investing confidence for only $49.50. Learn what it takes to be a successful investor with InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginners. This online course is self-paced over three months with live weekly webinars designed to help you achieve your financial goals and create wealth. To start your investing journey today, head to investsmart.com.au bootcamp or simply click the link in your podcast player.